don't have the little study you. They're not much of a study help, I'll guarantee you that. Revelation, the 13th chapter, we are in verse 11 tonight. That's where we'll start, verse 11. <clears throat> Another beast coming up out of the what? Out of the earth, yes. This is the earth beast, the land beast. Uh, the, uh, some individuals call him the beast of the terrain. So there's a lot of different names that are given to him. John writes this, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a what? As a dragon. And that's where we ended our discussion last week. Everybody got one? Very good. Thank you, thank you. The term beast in the Greek language literally means this, a wild beast. And folks, it's the same word that is used for the first beast, okay? A wild beast, a beast that is out in the wild, a beast that is untamed, a beast that uh, operates solely with all of its own uh, instincts and impulses. So just a wild beast. Um, here's something that's interesting about this beast, folks. This is the hardest part of the book of Revelation to interpret, okay? The land beast. Who was the sea beast? Who, who, we said everybody agrees on the sea beast. Who is it? The Roman Empire. Then we get to the land beast, same chapter, and guess what? There is no agreement whatsoever as to who this land beast is. Brother West in his commentary makes this statement. These verses constitute a highly controversial passage. There has long been a deep hunger to know who the second beast is. Searching for the answer has resulted in all kinds of ideas, theories, and speculations. Some have given up in despair, declaring there is no way of understanding this section. Therefore, we tread quietly and softly but confidently through these verses. Uh, he goes on to say that if he looked at every one of the different alternatives, they would have to write an entire another book just relative to the various theories as to who this land beast is. So uh, it's a very difficult um, a difficult study. Um, I'm studying about six commentaries to do this particular class and let me read you the interpretations that these individuals put on this land beast. Number one, Haley. Now brother Haley uh, is a member of the church and here's what he writes. To the people of John's day the beast represented paganism or the sacerdotal system of paganism in one of its most repulsive forms, emperor worship. So Homer Haley believes that the second beast, the beast of the land, is emperor worship. Okay? Waycaster, that's another member of the church. He's a teacher at the Memphis School of Preaching at this point. He says this, This beast, also called the false prophet, symbolizes, listen to him, all false religion and false philosophy, regardless of what period of time in which it might appear. Okay, so he believes that it just symbolizes what? All false religion. Okay, any false religion at any given time. Brother Wallace. Now, Brother Wallace is an old restoration preacher. And here's what Brother Wallace says. Because the events surrounded Jerusalem and the Jewish state... And the land in this vision meant the land of Palestine, especially Judea. The beast is the symbol of the Jewish persecutors in Palestine. Okay. Uh, have we looked and seen that the term, the land, means Judaism or Palestine several times? We've seen that, haven't we? And where does this beast rise up out of? Out of the land, does it not? The second beast rises up out of the land. So if the land is Palestine, then it seems as though this beast may have been uh, something that rises up out of Judaism, according to Brother Wallace. Now, here's Brother West. He too is a member of the church. He writes this. 
The beast that came up out of the sea was the Roman Empire. And that the reigning monarch was Nero. And that Nero was the emperor when this book was written. Folks, he believes that the beast of the land is Nero, one of the emperors of Rome. The Roman Empire was the beast of the sea. And then rising up out of the land was who? One of the emperors by the name of Nero. He gives five proofs in his commentary as to why he thinks this is Nero. And we'll talk about those uh, later on in our study. Barnes and Clark, they're the only two that agree. But they disagree with everybody else. They believe that this is the Roman papacy. The Roman papacy. Okay, so uh, we've got six commentators and we've got five different views, don't we? Wow. And now it's up to me to do what? Tell you which one this is. Just stay on for the ride, folks. We might get there. Notice the deceptive nature of the beast. He has two horns like a what? Like a lamb. Folks, is a lamb calm, peaceful, tranquil? When you think of a lamb, most individuals think of a lamb being something that is very gentle in nature. So this beast, when you first look upon him, he has the appearance of what? Of a lamb. Something that's kind and gentle and nice. But then he opens up his mouth and the Bible says this. And he spake as a dragon. Boy, that word dragon does not have good connotations in the book of Revelation, does it? Who is the dragon of Revelation? Satan himself. And he spake as a dragon. So he has the appearance, the outward appearance, of being something that's nice, gentle, kind. But when he speaks and he opens up and tells you what's on the inside, folks, it is just as wicked and vile and violent as it could possibly be. The voice of a dragon. Now notice the next point, Revelation 13, 12. And he exerciseth all the power of who? The first beast before him. Folks, the first beast was powerful, was he not? And from whom did he get his power? Nobody remembers? Nobody remembers where the first beast got his power? Ah, folks, he got his power from Satan, did he not? According to Revelation 13, verse 2. Now notice the text says that this land beast exercises all the power of who? The first beast, folks. He is just as wicked and just as authoritative as the first beast is. Unbelievable. Um... This beast was aligned with the first beast and with the dragon himself. So we've got uh, two individuals who are working on behalf of who? Satan. Wow. Two powers working on behalf of Satan. Some see the beast as the authority of the provinces of Rome who have been delegated power by Rome to do their bidding. Okay. Others believe that the land beast is a spiritual power that bows to the authority of Rome. Some say it is the authority of the papacy. Others believe it was the Jewish authorities who submitted to the power of Rome. Now remember it has two what? Two horns that make it look like a lamb. And it also has a voice like a dragon. Some have said that the two horns could be the proconsul of a province. And then, I'm, I'm sorry, that the two horns would represent the spiritual component of a province. And that the voice of the dragon would be who? The proconsul who spoke on behalf of whom? Of Rome. Okay, the authority, the beast himself. Okay, or, or the sea beast. Uh, very, very difficult to determine exactly what's going on. But notice what this beast does. He causeth the earth... And them that dwell therein to do what? To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He causes 
this land beast causes the whole world to worship who? The first beast. And the first beast is who? The Roman Empire. He causes all the world to fall down and worship the Roman Empire, folks. That little word worship, we've talked about it. To kiss. To kiss the hand toward. One man makes this statement. This may help implant the definition on your mind somewhat. Like a dog who licks its master's hand. Man, that's a nasty definition, isn't it? To fawn or crouch to. To prostrate oneself in homage. To do reverence or adore. Thayer says that it means to kiss the hand to in token of respect. Used of homage, show to men and beings of higher rank. One individual asked this question, How can it be said that men would worship an anti-Christian government? Isn't that something? How can men worship an anti-Christian government? He then posed this answer. One of the possibilities is that the worship under consideration is that of respect for and submission to the government per se. Folks, do we have choices in our lives as to whom we will obey? Yes. We have, we have choices, don't we? And when those choices present themselves, sometimes we have to choose between one thing and God, don't we? Do governments like to be rebelled against? Do governments like for you to look at them and tell them that they're wrong? No. Do they like for you to look at them and tell them that they need to be submissive to the God of heaven? Folks, they don't like that. Okay? I don't know, to be honest with you, of a government on earth right now that takes that position. Okay? Who truly yields itself and bows itself to the desires of Jehovah God. Not a government on the earth. Isn't that something? Do governments want you to be submissive? Do they want you to bow to them? Do they want you to take up their agenda? Absolutely. Folks, Rome was notorious for it. Okay? Rome was the world power. Rome was the uh, you know, leader of the entire world at the time. And everybody was to bow the knee to who? To Rome. And so it was very easy uh, for this term worship to come to uh, indicate um, submission to the authority of the Roman Empire. To bow to who? To bow to the Caesars, to bow to Nero, to, to whomever was in power at the time. Okay, so it was the responsibility of the land beast, okay, to make certain that the entirety of the world bowed to who? Bowed to the Roman government. Okay? Bowed to the Roman government. Now, let me ask you this. We're way back in the first century, aren't we? Or at least we're supposed to be way back in the first century. And there was a nation that existed at this particular time that was known as Israel. Right? Known as Israel. And Israel was said to worship who? The Almighty God. So let me ask you this. Did Rome get Israel to bow the knee to Rome? Mike says, some of them. We've talked about this a little bit in our classes before. Okay. Um... Turn over to John 19, 15. John 19. What kind of government was Israel supposed to have? What's the name of the government? 
a theocracy. What does that mean? God ruled. Okay, it was a God ruled theocracy. Now, um, did they reject that at one point in time? Yes. They rejected God and they wanted a king, did they not? And they instilled Saul as their first king, then David, then Solomon, then the kingdom divided. 19 kings in the north, 19 kings in the south, and then both got taken into captivity, didn't they? Only the southern kingdom returned to the land of Israel. Guess what they did not have when they came back? They no longer had a king. They no longer had a king. You can't tell me who the king of Israel was once the children of Israel came back from Babylonian captivity. And the reason is because they what? They didn't have one. They were again a what? A theocracy. Who was the head person in charge of the theocracy as far as man was concerned? The high priest. And it was the high priest who made intercession between God and who? And the people, didn't he? Okay? And that, that was the kind of government that Israel had. But, when we open up the New Testament, who is the ruling authorities of the day? Who is the ruling authority of the day? The Roman Empire is. Okay? The Roman Empire is in authority at this particular time, folks. And listen to what the Jews say in John 19, 15. We have no king but who? Caesar. You know what they should have said? We have no king but God. But they didn't say that. They show that we as a nation are loyal to whom? We as a nation are loyal to Caesar. Question. Under the Old Covenant, were there any commands for a death sentence to be carried out? Yes. Name uh, one sin that individuals would commit that was punishable by death. Adultery, that was one. Okay, if a man or a woman were taken in adultery, both of them were to be put to death by how? By stoning, right? Um, in the New Testament, though, Okay, when Jesus was living, could the Jews put anyone to death? Maybe I should change that. What's that? <laughs> See, that's a trick question, isn't it? They had the authority to do it through the Old Testament, right? Guess who took that authority away? Rome removed capital punishment from the hands of the Jews. Okay? And that's why when they arrested Jesus, they had a problem, did they not? They wanted Jesus what? Crucified, right? The only law he had broken was whose law? The Jewish law. So they had to trump up charges against him, did he not? And the charge that they trumped up was this. He calls himself what? A king. Uh-oh. Now he's put himself up against who? Against the Caesars, hasn't he? Okay, so now they have a charge against him for which he can be put to death by whom? By Rome. Okay? Um, and sadly, that's exactly what transpired, and they got exactly what they wanted. But I just find it interesting that Jew, the Jews had bowed the knee to Rome and had removed the, the capital punishment off the table unless it was approved by who? Unless it was approved by Rome. In other words, they don't care what God says anymore. God says we can do this. But guess what? Ah, Rome doesn't want us to, so we just won't do it unless Rome says we can. Guess what they've just done? They've just bowed the knee to who again? 
They just bow the knee to Rome again. Folks, they're letting individuals know that even though they would never say that we worship, that we adore, that we pay homage to Rome, in actuality, they did. Okay? In actuality, they did. West, in his commentary, makes this note. The Jews allowed a temple of Tiberius Caesar to stand on their soil in Caesarea. The temple or its remains can be seen today sunken beneath the waters of the Mediterranean Sea. Folks, the Jews allowed Rome to build a temple to to Tiberius. Who is Tiberius? Folks, he's one of the Caesars. So they allowed a temple to be built in their land dedicated to whom? To Caesar, for emperor worship in the land of Palestine. Don't tell me the Jews didn't bow the knee to who? To Rome. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Folks, when governments get powerful, they start making demands on people. Okay? And sometimes their demands go totally against God's will, don't they? And guess what we have to do? We have to make a decision. Now, we don't have to obey God. We don't have to. Not if we don't want to. We should, but we don't have to. Right? And you'd be surprised how many people that will look at me and say this, well, this is what the government says to do. I don't care. I could care less what the government says to do if it violates what God says to do. I don't care. I had an elder when all this pandemic started. He says, Vic, what are we going to do? He says, this Sunday, if we open up the church building, he said, they're going to have police stationed outside our building and they'll arrest us if we come and try to worship. You know what Vic would have done? I'd had my keys out. I'd been up there at that building opening the door. If they said, what you doing? I said, we got worship this morning. Worship? You can't worship. Oh, yes, we can. God said we can. God said we must. Oh, we can't do it. We can't allow that. We're going to arrest you. Cuff me. Do what, just do what you got to do. Take me to jail. Folks, we cannot bow the knee to government. Can't do that. Okay? It's unbelievable. The first beast causeth the earth to worship who? The first beast. Now watch this next point. And he doeth What? Great wonders, wow. And he doeth great wonders. So he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Wonders. A sign, a mark, a token. That by which a thing or person is distinguished from others and is known. Most of the time indicating miraculous works. Folks, if I tell you to do something command you to do something and then I perform a huge miracle behind that, does that give proof that I'm pretty potent? Oh yes. You know, that puts the fear of God in the minds of some people, doesn't it? Wow! Look at him! Not only does he have authoritative words, but he has what? He has authoritative powers. And those powers have a tendency to confirm the Word, don't they? And so individuals are convinced that the thing that I said because of the work that I performed is what? It's true. And it's authoritative. And individuals need to abide by it. Man. Folks, these signs, however were lying wonders. And they were intended 
to deceive the masses. Now we know that from the next verse and we'll get there in a second, okay? But these are lying wonders. Turn over to Revelation eleven five for just a minute. Somebody just read that to me. 11, 5. Ah, who is that passage talking about? No? Who, who, who are these individuals that he's talking about? And if any man hurt them, the two prophets. Remember we studied the two prophets of God that arose up in the city? Now notice the power that these two prophets have. If any man hurt them, what will they do? Fire shall proceed out of their mouth. Listen to this. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Folks, what does Satan always try to do? He tries to mimic the powers of God, doesn't he? Folks, if he can mimic the powers of God, then guess what? He can deceive the masses, can he not? If what this false prophet does looks just like what the true prophet does, then how do you know who to believe? Right? You see, you put the people in a quandary because now they have to make a decision. And that's tough. Jesus says this, And there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's found in Matthew 24, verse 44, where, uh, verse 24, where Jesus is talking about, guess what? The fall of the city of who? Jerusalem. There's going to rise up false Christ. There's going to rise up false apostles. There's going to rise up false prophets. And what are they going to do? They're going to do great signs and wonders. So much so that they will almost deceive even who? The elect of God. Wow. Wallace makes this statement in his commentary. Josephus relates that two representatives of Nero by the name of Albinus and Gesius Florus in this very period were sent into the land and being notorious for wickedness, they made pompous ostentations before the people. In other words, Nero intentionally sent out false prophets to do great works during his day. Can individual, can, can, can magicians do some pretty great things? Un, it's unbelievable to me some of the stuff they can do. What are you going to say, Larry? Oh, yeah. And we'll get to some application here in just a little bit, but uh, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, it, all this stuff still goes on today, doesn't it? And, and deceives people, tricks people, and uh, it's, um, it's kind of scary. Turn over to Ephesians 4 for just a minute. I want to show you something. This is an interesting text. Ephesians 4, 13 and 14. Everybody makes these kind of statements. Man, I sure do wish I could have lived in the first century. I sure do wish I could have seen the apostles. Man, I wish I could have seen some of those miracles that they did. How many of you have made statements like that? Oh, don't lie. Put your hand up. Okay. Folks, I, I've even said, wouldn't it be wonderful to have been there and see some of those things? It's it just been amazing. I told you, I'd love to have seen Jesus Take those two lo those uh, loaves and fishes and just turn them into baskets of food. That's unbelievable. But folks, it wasn't as great as it seems. And Paul writes about it in Ephesians 4, 13 and 14. He's writing about miraculous gifts. 
And he tells us that these miraculous gifts are going to last, notice the first word in verse 13, till. Folks, that is an adverb of time. Okay? Till, T-I-L-L, till. These miraculous gifts, these um, manifestations of the Holy Spirit that we have, they're going to last till this particular point in time. Now, when is that? Well, here's what he says. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, he doesn't say exactly what he's talking about, does he? You have to understand the terms that he's using. Till we come to what? Number one, the unity of the faith. Of the faith. Folks, what is the faith? No. You use, use the right terms, folks. The faith. Folks, it is the system of faith. It is the New Testament of Jesus Christ. These miracles are going to continue till we come to the unity of the faith. Until the full, complete, written revelation from God to man is given, miracles are going to continue. Now notice how he goes on to describe that time period. Unto a what? Perfect man. A full grown man. Okay? Folks, the church in the first century was in infancy, wasn't it? It was born in the city of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And it was just a baby, wasn't it? And the only revelation that they had at that time was the revelation that came through who? Through the apostles. And folks, it took several years in order for that revelation to be given, did it not? So the only way for the Word of God to be confirmed was for those individuals to do what? Do a miracle to confirm the Word. Okay? Paul says, man, I cannot wait until we reach the time when the unity of the faith comes, that we're at that point in time when we are a perfect man, and notice what he says, unto the measure of the stature of the what? Fullness of Christ. Folks, he couldn't wait until the time of total, complete, New Testament maturity. Now, why was he so eager for that time to come. He tells us in the next verse. That we henceforth be no more what? Children. He said we're like children right now. We're just what? We're just, we're just little infants. We're just little babies right now. We're just small children running around. Folks, can small children be influenced by anybody and everybody? Oh Yeah. That's why it's dangerous to put your children in classrooms where they're going to be taught heinous stuff like transgenderism at elementary school and below. Folks, that's ridiculous. You know that? You don't do that. Children are easily manipulated, are they not? Now notice what Paul says too. Carried about by every what? Wind of doctrine. Now notice how that was done. By the slight of men and by cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to what? To deceive. Did Paul have to constantly fight false teachers? Yeah. Folks, there, there is not a book in the New Testament that is not somewhat filled with controversy. Okay? Not one. And in almost every book that Paul writes... He talks about false teachers who've entered into these congregations and who are deceiving them. We've been studying the book of Galatians in our men's class on Thursday night. And Judaizing teachers had entered into these congregations and Paul was just flabbergasted. How so soon removed you are from the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Folks, Paul is upset at what's going on. But you see, it was easy, wasn't it? Paul comes in, he teaches the truth, he performs miracles, doesn't he? False teachers come right in behind him.
They teach their doctrine, and what do they do? They do their lying wonders, don't they? Paul calls down fire from heaven, and guess what the false teachers do? Call down fire from heaven. Paul brings frogs out of the Nile River. Now, he didn't do that. But guess what? Moses did. And guess who did exactly the same thing? Pharaoh's magicians, didn't they? You see, they would, copy, they would do their best to copy the miracles that the true teachers of God would do. So then, the congregation is just left up in the air, aren't they? Man, who do we believe? Do we believe Paul or do we believe the false teachers? It's whoever could, could now provide the most convincing arguments, right? Look at Paul. He's an apostle. He says he's an apostle. Now nah, he was taught by Ananias. Paul. Look how little and weak he is. He talks tough, but he's not much. Look at Paul. He, he, didn't, even, he was, didn't even live with Jesus. He was, if you're going to be an apostle, you're supposed to have been with Jesus from the baptism of John until Jesus ascended back to the right hand of God. Paul missed it all, and he calls himself an apostle. This Paul, who is he? And everybody starts thinking, you know, all that's true, isn't it? He is kind of weak, little bitty dude. He wasn't with the Lord. Ananias, he even told us, Ananias came and taught him. Maybe Paul's not an apostle, so guess what they do? They're easily led, aren't they? Well, folks, guess what you can't do today? You can't easily lead people away anymore. You want to know why? We got the good book. That's what we got, okay? And aren't you glad we do? See, Paul was looking for the time we have spiritual maturity till we come to what? The unity of the faith. When the New Testament is written, now we can know the truth and we can combat false teachers, can't we? We don't have to be led astray. That little term, slight of men, means fraud, trickery. Cunning craftiness means trickery and sophistry. Folks, these guys were good, okay? They were good. And they knew exactly what they were doing. Now notice that next verse, Revelation 13, 14. And deceiveth them that what? Dwell on the earth. Folks, that's the mission of Satan, isn't it? That was the mission of the land beast. That was the mission of the sea beast. That was the mission of who? That was the mission of Satan himself. The Bible even refers to him as the what? The deceiver. Folks, that is his job to deceive. Now, next week, we're going to ask a question, okay? Let me ask you this. Is it easy to deceive people? It's easy to deceive people? This morning, I wrote a uh, post on Facebook, and it was titled, Many and Many. That was the title of it. I looked at two verses, 1 John 4, verse 1. Okay, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are what? Gone out into the world. Guys, there's not, a, there's not a couple of false prophets in the world. There's many. There's thousands. There's millions of these jokers out there. Many of them. Now, what's sad is what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, verse 1. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. By whom, by reason of whom, the way of truth is evil spoken of. So you got many false teachers, and you got many who what? Follow them. So man's easily what? Man's easily deceived. I wrote this question because it just hit me. Why is it that man is so easily deceived on so many fronts? especially religiously. I'll give you one example. And this, this is true. There are many, many women today and men who believe that a baby in the mother's womb is nothing more than a clump of cells. 
I'm serious. Go on YouTube or something and, and, and watch some of these people argue these points. Okay? This one woman asked this other woman, she says, what is that in that woman's womb? And she said, a clump of sails. That's, that, that, that's all she... And, and I'm, I mean, they are dead serious when they say that. That's exactly what they believe. And folks, if that's what you believe, is it easy to abort that baby? Yeah, it's just a clump of sails. We're just cutting out a few sails. How, how, how can we... How can people be deceived into thinking that? How do you do that? And yet, the Bible talks about it. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. And folks, it's easy for us to get deceived as well. You know what? It's unbelievable. So we'll talk about that one next week. Thank you, thank you.